Welcome, everyone. Uh, we acknowledge the land on which McMaster University was built is the traditional territory of the Haudenosaunee and Anishinaabe peoples, many of whom continue to live and work here today. The territory is covered by the Upper Canada Treaties and is within the land protected by the Dish with One Spoon Wampum Agreement. Today, this gathering place is home to First Nations, Métis, and Inuit peoples. Thank you so much for joining us this evening for this session of Syndemic, our series on the challenges COVID-19 has posed for humanity. And please join us on the 15th of July at 7 p.m. Eastern Daylight Time for our last presentation by Chandrima Chakraborty, who will address the implications of the pandemic for racialized Canadians. Our thanks to the Future Canada Project and Chancellor Emeritus L. R. Wilson for their generous support for this series. Nicholas Christakis is one of the world's most influential and respected interpreters of the COVID-19 crisis. In 2013, Christakis moved from Harvard to Yale University, where he is professor in the Department of Sociology, with additional appointments in the Department of Ecology and Evolutionary Biology, Statistics and Data Science, Biomedical Engineering, Medicine, and in the School of Management. In 2018, he was appointed Sterling Professor, the highest honor bestowed on Yale faculty. His third book, Blueprint, The Evolutionary Origins of a Good Society, 2019, built on his already highly influential interpretation of social networks and made the New York Times bestseller list. His recent study, Apollo's Arrow, which you see here, The Profound and Enduring Impact of Coronavirus on the Way We Live, 2020, focused on the pandemic in the US and is sure to stand as one of the most influential interpretations of the recent crisis. In his virtual visit to McMaster, Dr. Christakis will present his interpretation of 2021 and will be available afterwards to answer questions. Great, so welcome Nicholas. <laughs> To, thank you, Ian. To Hamilton. <laughs> yes, thank you. I, you know, I, I come to here. <laughs> I come to, well, I wish I was there. I come to Canada a lot. Uh, for many years, we used to summer in Cape Breton in the Highland oh, National Park. Yeah. Uh, and we would, uh, I can't tell you how many times I've been on that little tiny Port Elizabeth ferry that goes across and uh, we've spent so much time there. And of course, I've been to Quebec countless times and, uh, and, and uh, Vancouver and Ontario and Toronto. I've been to most of the can major Canadian cities, so I wish I was there, uh, yeah. but I'm not. So <laughs> I've, with that introduction, if you want me to proceed, I prepared sure. like 30 minutes of remarks, which is, I'm gonna skip a lot of the stuff that's in the book, and I'm just gonna put some ideas on the table. And, um, <clears throat> and then uh, we can have a conversation with the time that's remaining. Oh, yeah. So all of, us, all of us happen to be alive during a once in a century event something very unusual is happening to us as a species, which is that a new pathogen has been introduced into our midst. And this pathogen is gonna be with us forever. From the point of view of the pathogen, it is having what is known as an ecological release. It's like an invasive species, as if we had taken rats to an isolated Pacific Island and introduced them there and they overran the place. Our bodies are the island to the virus, which is the rat. We, it, the rat has found you know, uh, sort of untouched territory in us. We have no natural immunity to this pathogen and it's gonna spread and spread and spread among us like any other living thing would do. There's some debate about whether viruses are living or not, but for the purposes of this conversation, it's acting in a, in a Darwinian way like any other living thing. And we know quite a bit about the pathogen at this point, although candidly, we knew most of these things about the pathogen very early on by January of 2020. For example, we know that the pathogen um, is reasonably deadly. It kills between 0.5 and 0.8% of the people that it infects. That's known, the, known as the infection fatality rate, the IFR. And if you get symptoms of the disease, uh, it's about twice as deadly. Uh, between one and 1.6% of people who get symptoms of the disease will die. If you were an infectious disease doctor, I was a hospice doctor for many years. I took care of people who were dying. Uh, so I didn't often take care of primary infections, but I knew enough to know that, it is, that an infectious disease that kills 1% of the people it infects is a serious infection. You would not take that lightly. And we also know 
that this disease now, the, the mortality rate varies by age. Uh, if you're less than 20 and you get an infection, maybe you have a one in 10,000 chance of dying. If you're in your 50s and you get an infection uh, and you have symptoms from it, maybe a 1% chance of dying. If you're in your 70s or 80s and you get COVID you've got, and you get symptoms from it, you've got about a 20% chance of dying. That's a serious um, infection. Um, and we also know how transmissible, how infectious is this disease? So we just discussed its intrinsic lethality, but it also has some other intrinsic properties. One of the other intrinsic properties was its spreadability, its infectiousness. This is quantified by the famous so-called R0, the R sub zero, or the basic reproduction number. And that number for this virus is three. For each case of the virus in a non-immune, normally interacting host population, it creates three new cases. And that's also quite infectious. The, the seasonal flu, for example, might have an R0 of 1.5, barely able to reproduce itself. If you're infected, you infect one other person plus half an extra person. And in fact, having an R0 above one is in fact what makes a disease epidemic. You know, it rises and rises with time because each case creates more than just itself. Now, if you took these two parameters and you plotted them on a graph for all the respiratory pandemics of the last hundred years, so on the x-axis, you put the severity or the lethality of the condition, and on the y-axis, the infectiousness, up here in the upper right, you would have the 1918 influenza pandemic, which was the most lethal respiratory pandemic we've had in the last hundred years. And down here in the lower left, we would have the 2009 H1N1 pandemic. All of us lived through that pandemic. Probably none of us really think about it or remember it because it wasn't very lethal. It just gave you the sniffles. And in here in the middle, you would have the 1957 uh, influenza pandemic, which was the second most deadly pandemic we've had in the last hundred years until now. And in the United States, it killed 110,000 Americans, which would be about 220,000 um, today. So the, night, the COVID-19, however, based on these parameters is between 57 and 1918, right here, okay? And you could have discerned this ab initio, like from the beginning, back in January, because these parameters were released by Chinese scientists and later in February by Italian scientists. So there was nothing surprising at all, candidly, about what has happened to us since then. And one of the reasons I wrote the book is that I was so frustrated, Ian and I were talking about this earlier, I was so frustrated by the, the awful public discourse we were having about this epidemic, especially on the part of our leaders who are minimizing the risk. Um, and as it turns out, we later learned simply suppressing the evidence that was um, available. So, so this epidemic that we have had is, is that we're still in the middle of is quite serious. I, I do not think we are at the beginning of the end of this pandemic, but we are thankfully approaching the end of the beginning, at least in North America, uh, although the rest of the world is, is going to follow us. Um, you may have been paying attention to what is happening in some of the more populous regions around the world, like in India, in Indonesia, in Brazil, now in uh, sub-Saharan Africa, where the epidemic, in particular because of these new variants, is taking off. And we are once again reading headlines that are astonishing. Um, in India, for example, that the funeral pyres are burning day and night, just like on the fields of Troy 3,000 years ago in Homer's Iliad uh, described this kind of event. And in fact, one of the things that I would say is that while the way we have come to live in the time of COVID-19 may feel alien and unnatural, and it is, it's actually neither of those things. Plagues are a feature of the human experience. They're in the Bible. They're in Homer, right? One of the canonical works of Western fiction, uh, you know, one of our oldest extant written things begins with a plague, right? I mean, that's how the Iliad begins with a plague in an, in an absolutely magical story, which we can talk about if you're more interested or better yet, just read the Iliad. It's a ma magnificent book. Uh, plagues are in Shakespeare. They're in Cervantes. They're in countless uh, pieces of literature in, non in the non-Western tradition. So what happened in 2020 was not new to our species. It was just new to us. We thought what was happening was so nuts, so crazy, so unjust, so wrong that we had to endure this. And yet our ancestors have had these experiences. We forget, we human beings forget and are shocked. And yet the irony is that we had an oral tradition, not just in literature, but also in religion, right? So many of my Jewish friends during the Seder, during Passover, 
in 2020 he said their whole lives they've been doing the Passover Seder, talking about the biblical plagues, but now it meant, felt different to them, <laughs> you know, as they were as they were saying the Seder. So our ancestors tried to warn us about this uh, with our oral tradition. And we also had a scientific memory among medical historians and historians, people like uh, Professor McKay, for example, and among epidemiologists. We have like expertise in our society that looks to the past and says, wait a minute, something similar is happening right now. And yet we had no collective personal memory. There were very few people who had personally experienced such a serious uh, epidemic. Certainly very few people in North America who had had this experience. And this is one of the reasons I think we were caught off guard. Um, and one of the other, and these plagues unfold in almost a stereotypic way, not just epidemiologically, but also socially. And let me just illustrate some of this with just some small excerpts and small ideas to put on the table. One of the things that's important to understand is that the plagues require collective action and often, not always, state power uh, to respond to. You, you cannot fight an invading army alone. If, if the Canadians were to take up arms and come to the border and invade the United States, um, you know, my grabbing my gun and going to you know, the frontier would be useless against that. Uh, it, but even if every uh, un, uh, American citizen grabbed their gun and ran to the frontier, it would also be useless. We would have to coordinate our defense. Um, and, and this type of coordination that is required is, is reflects the collective nature of the threat that we are facing, that this is a contagious disease that is afflicting all of us at the same time. Many people began to think that what we were doing in response to the virus was collapsing our economy, that it was the state actions like closing schools and closing borders that were the problem. But actually it's the virus that is the problem. Uh, one estimate of the economic impact of the virus in the United States that was executed by Larry Summers, the former treasury secretary and David Cutler, uh, a former colleague of mine at Harvard, also an economist, they called this the $16 trillion virus. $8 trillion in economic damage to our society and $8 trillion in loss of life, disability, illness, and so on. This is a cataclysmic event in the history of our society. It is an economic shock that is almost as great as the Great Depression. And I don't think people fully appreciate the magnitude of this yes, yet. And many people, as I was saying, wrongly think that it's our actions or state actions in particular that are causing the problem, but this is not correct. It's the virus that's doing it because this physical distancing and this economic collapse, this slowing down are, have been features of plagues for thousands of years. For example, during the plague of Justinian, which was a bubonic plague, Yersinia pestis, over 1500 years ago, um, historian and priest John of Ephesus had this to say. He said, and in all ways, everything was brought to naught, was destroyed and turned into sorrow and buying and selling ceased and the shops with all their worldly riches beyond description and the money lenders large shops, he means the banks closed. The entire city then came to a standstill as if it had perished. Thus, everything ceased and stopped. Such accounts of the effects of epidemic disease are now eerily familiar, aren't they? An economy involves exchanges and these depend on social interactions. It's very hard to have an economy or a functioning society when people are unable to interact because a germ is spreading that kills them, right? This is a very stereotypic feature of plagues. And there were others too that we revisited. For example, fear and lies and denial have always been companions of plagues for thousands of years. In fact, denial is such a constant feature of epidemics that we might even think of denial as an essential aspect of an epidemic. In other words, we might even add social factors to our de epidemiological definition of what it means to have an epidemic. If you think, if you see plague as one of the four horsemen of the apocalypse, mendacity is its squire <laughs> following right behind it. So, you know, you can look at social networks as my lab has, and today's talk is not about some of the more uh, sort of mathematically, uh, mathematical aspects of spreading processes on social graphs that my laboratory studies, but you can, you can mathematically analyze the spread of germs across social connections from, from me to my friend, to my friend's friends, to my friend's friends, and so on. And right behind it though, is misinformation that's spreading. And this type of superstition 
And mendacity has been a feature of plagues for thousands of years, as incidentally has been denial. So when I saw denial rear its head again a year ago, as that pandemic was crashing upon our shores, at the highest levels of government, for example, in the White House, but not just there, elsewhere as well, I was on the one hand, you know, completely dismayed and disappointed, but on the other hand, completely unsurprised because, you know, denial is a feature of plagues and not just in our leaders, frankly, in the person on the street, right? And it's almost a human response. Nobody wants to believe this is happening, right? We would rather deny and, and, and not believe that it's happening. There's some scientific work my lab has done if you're interested in what we call dueling contagions. One of the ways that you can think about epidemics is that there is a, a biological contagion as the virus spreads from person to person. And in parallel to that, there are social contagions, for example, of, 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 of accurate or inaccurate information that's spreading or of behaviors, for example, mask wearing or vaccination. So your probability of getting the germ depends on whether your friends have the germ and your friends' friends have the germ and so on. And your probability of putting on a mask, uh, as Professor McKay and I were talking about before the lecture, uh, depends on whether your friends are wearing a mask or your friends' friends are wearing a mask. So you have on one, in this graph, in this social network, you have a biological contagion. And in parallel to that, you have social contagion. And in, the, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a sense, the question is, which one is going to win? Will the social contagion outstrip, in some sense, the biological contagion? Plagues are also a time of blame. Uh, uh, this is very typical that we blame others. Uh, during the bubonic outbreaks, for example, there was a rise in antisemitism. You know, the Jews were blamed. Hundreds of people, Jews especially, were burnt at the stake, buried alive, and tortured in the most unspeakable ways during the time of, during the time of plague. Although interestingly, Pope Clement VI, was, uh, who was the Pope uh, during the first outbreak of plague in 1347, was surprisingly enlightened actually on this topic. Actually, he was a very interesting man in many regards. Uh, his humanity comes through actually from some of his correspondence um, about the plague. Uh, but we also saw the same thing, for example, with the HIV epidemic in the United States, like gays were blamed or Haitians were blamed or IV drug users were blamed. Uh, and during the COVID pandemic, you know, uh, immigrants are blamed. Always we wish to blame some other person for our predicament. Now there's an interesting set of ideas as to why we might do that. And one idea that I think may hold some water is that uh, human beings find it more appealing to imagine that there's human agency behind the calamity that has befallen us, that actually some other humans are responsible because that's much more appealing than the alternatives, which are, for example, that it's an implacable God that hates us, right? That's not very appealing. Or uh, that it's the inexorable workings of the natural world, which is also not appealing. So I think, you know, if you have to pick between nature, God, or someone else is at fault, we pick someone else. And this is one of the reasons why blame has been a feature of plagues in my judgment. There are some ideas we can talk about, which we maybe do during, do, during the Q&A on how plague is a time of meaning and how meaning arises during times of plague as well. And how as well, they are a time of loss, right? Grief walks the streets during times of plague. We lose our lives, we lose our livelihoods, and we lose our way of life. And the kind of psychological malaise that we have seen actually has been described also for thousands of years. So Marcus Aurelius talks about how during the, uh, the plague uh, 2,000 years ago, a plague that afflicted Rome, uh, you know, the, yes, the deaths from the germ were bad, he said, but in some ways the psychological depression was worse, this man observed 2,000 years ago. And what we had to do, and we still will have to do, is to implement a series of responses but I, that I um, like to think of in keeping with a, something known as the Swiss cheese model. The Swiss cheese model was a, a, a model introduced by psychologist James Reason about 30 years ago to think about the failure of complex socio-technical systems, systems that have biological, human, and technological components. Why do they fail? And uh, he thought that there were layers of defense like slices of Swiss cheese each slice of which was good, but imperfect. There were some holes in it. So you can imagine, for example, that our layers of defense against COVID are, you know, masking is a layer uh, and vaccination is a layer and quarantine is a layer and testing is a layer and hand washing is a layer and school closure is a layer and border closure is a layer. So each of these is a layer of defense, but each of these is not perfect. There's some holes in that layer. 
a certain number of holes and a certain size of holes, and they're randomly distributed. So you should have the intuition that if you have a single layer of defense, the virus could penetrate that layer if it happened to line up with a hole. But if you lined up several layers of defense, by the time you got to the third or fourth piece of Swiss cheese, there would be no sequence of holes that was perfectly aligned. And this is why we need to implement more than one layer of defense. Why, for example, school closure alone is not enough or border closure alone is not enough. And also incidentally, why vaccination alone is not enough. Vaccines are fantastic, but they are not perfect. And this is why for, the, for some time, we're gonna to need to not only be vaccinated, but engage in certain other layers of defense like mask wearing and gathering bands and so on. Uh, another important idea, epidemiological idea that I would like to introduce, and then I'm going to um, talk a little bit about the sort of three phases of epidemics and then close with some, um, some um, final remarks. Uh, the idea I'd like to put on the table is this notion of herd immunity. Now herd immunity is an old concept in epidemiology. Uh, and it's the idea that a population of people can be immune from a condition, even if not every individual within the population is immune. For example, if you vaccinate 96% of the population against measles, and one of the 4% unvaccinated people gets measles, you don't get an outbreak because there's no one for them to spread it to. They're surrounded by immune individuals. That 96% is the herd immunity threshold. And you should have the intuition that the more contagious is a disease, the more infectious it is, the higher it's R naught, the higher the herd immunity threshold. And you can compute the herd immunity threshold by a standard formula, which is R naught minus one divided by R naught. So for an R naught of three, that's three minus one divided by three, that means 67% of the population needs to be immune, either naturally because they survived the infection or artificially because they were vaccinated before you reach this threshold. It turns out for certain network science reasons I won't go into that calculation makes certain assumptions which aren't necessarily true. So you have to downwardly revise the number for the original native Wuhan strain, uh, uh, the herd immunity threshold was about 50%. Now it's gone up with a variance, but that's another whole topic we can discuss. Anyway, with that little bit of epidemiological background, let me sort of talk about what are gonna be the three phases of the epidemic. And those are the acute, the intermediate, and the post-pandemic phase. The acute phase of the epidemic is when we're feeling the biological and epidemiological impact of the virus. And that'll last until we reach herd immunity, either naturally or artificially uh, through vaccination, which means that it's gonna last through the end of 2021, the beginning of 2022, where we're gonna be living in a changed world, wearing masks, uh, having you know, other kinds of non-pharmaceutical interventions that we use to cope with it as the virus moves through the population. But eventually we will reach this important threshold. Uh, and thank goodness we're able to do it mostly through vaccination uh, right now, which is a, another whole topic uh, we could discuss. I'm just giving you a little bit of a flavor now in the 30 minutes that are allotted to me. Uh, but, uh, but then we're gonna enter the post-pandemic phase. I'm sorry, then we're gonna enter the intermediate phase after the immediate phase, beginning at the end of 2021, beginning of 2022. And that's gonna last about a year or two. And that is until the end of 2023. And that is when we are coping with the clinical, psychological, economic, and social aftershocks of the virus. It's like a tsunami has washed ashore. Now the waters have receded, which is great, but we now need to cope with all the damage, right? So probably five times as many people as die of the disease will have some kind of long-term disability. I'm not talking about long or short COVID. I'm saying you've recovered from COVID, but your body has been damaged by the infection. You have pulmonary fibrosis, you have psychiatric or neurological sequelae or renal or cardiac or pancreatic problems. So in the United States, if as many as a million people die, we might have 5 million Americans that are gonna need clinical care who will need resources and hospitals and clinics and other attention. We're gonna have millions of children that have missed school and lost a year of schooling will need attention. We're gonna have the psychological sequelae. We're gonna have millions of Americans lost their jobs. Millions of businesses have closed, will need to be recapitalized. All of this will take time for us to cope with. And if you look at the history of epidemics, that typically takes a year or two till we get to the end of 2023 approximately. These are not hard and fast dates. They're gonna feather into each other, but then, we will enter the post-pandemic phase. And I think that's gonna be a little bit of a party, a little bit of like the roaring 20s of the 21st century 
like the roaring 20s of the 20th century. I think people will have been pooped up for a long time and now they're gonna relentlessly seek out social interactions in nightclubs and restaurants and bars and sporting events and political rallies and musical concerts. We might see some sexual licentiousness and some change in sexual mores. My sister, when she's heard me talk about this says, Nicholas, you should always hasten to add that that forecast only applies to unmarried couples. <laughs> um, but, um, but, but, and in fact, when I made remarks like this to um, a, a few months ago, another location, I got uh, the, the, one of the New York tabloids, the New York Post gave me the New York Post headline treatment said, you know, Yale professor predicts orgy. That's not <laughs> what I'm saying. I'm just saying that it's quite natural for human beings who have been denied social interactions to then when the time, when the danger threat is finally behind us to have a kind of more liberal kind of social interactions. Also during times of plague, people save their money. They become more abstemious and risk averse, uh, either because they fear getting sick, for example, they wanna conserve their resources or because the economy has collapsed and there's nowhere to spend money. But when the plague is over, people spend liberally. This has been seen for thousands of years. So you typically have an economic boom afterwards. And I think we're gonna see an entrepreneurial boom and also perhaps an efflorescence of the arts and uh, a kind of very um, effervescent uh, period of time when we finally put the epidemic uh, behind us. These respiratory pandemics come in waves. Uh, despite vaccination, right now we're going to have a good summer, but it's a kind of false uh, relief. Uh, we're going to have another bad winter next winter. It won't be as bad as last winter, but we are going to see rising mortality again in the coming winter, probably reimposition of some of the non-pharmaceutical interventions for a host of reasons we can discuss if you, if you want. Um, these vaccinations, uh, these vaccines that we've developed, I think we are the first generation of humans alive to have been able in real time to invent a specific and effective countermeasure speedily enough that we can modify the course of the epidemic. Uh, our ancestors, when coping with these threats, could not do such a thing, but we have been able to do such a thing. Uh, these vaccines uh, have been a godsend. I think we're going to have boosters, booster shots on the horizon uh, with these new variants. And these new variants that have emerged could put a spanner in the works, could affect some of the timing, you know, that I've just sort of outlined schematically a moment ago. I think uh, the rich nations of the world, including the United States and Canada, but also European countries, Japan and so on, China too, by the way, have a moral, economic and epidemiological rationale for vaccinating the world. I think there's a moral necessity for us to vaccinate the world. Uh, you know, we are the richest nation on earth. We are the scientifically most sophisticated uh, nation. We profess to global leadership. We should lead. Uh, and I include Canada in this. We have an economic rationale as well, because of course we need uh, global supply chains to be stood up. We need trading partners. Other countries, you know, we to be rich ourselves, we need people to trade with. And, uh, and so we need to vaccinate them. Uh, and finally, we have an epidemiological rationale. Even if you don't buy the moral argument and you don't buy the economic argument, uh, in a kind of very selfish save your skin argument, you should care that there are places around the world where the vaccine is running rampant, uh, I'm sorry, where the virus is running rampant and uh, could mutate into worrisome strains that will inevitably come to our shores and kill us. So for all these reasons, I think we, we should vaccinate the world. And the economic rationale is astonishing. It would cost just $50 billion to vaccinate 70% of the world. And the return on that, some have estimated, are many trillions of dollars. I mean, the return on investment is just astonishing. A couple of final remarks. I think it's important to understand that bad as this epidemic is, it could have been so much worse. There's no God-given reason this pathogen only kills 1% of the people it infects. It could have killed 10% or 30%. We could have been facing a bubonic plague type situation in the 21st century in our rich, scientifically advanced democracies. It's astonishing to contemplate, isn't it? Just dumb luck that the virus is this lethal and not more lethal. And the next pandemic could be that lethal. Unlike bubonic plague or cholera, for example, which are caused by bacteria for which we have many effective antibiotics, we have no good drugs to treat viruses to speak of. So our only hope is through vaccination. And it takes time to invent vaccines. So a deadly virus that kills 10 or 30% of the population, we would have been seeing a like, like in the movie Contagion, right? I mean, just an astonishing devastation in our society. This is why these threats need to be seen as a national security threat and why they require great probity, not just on the part of the citizenry, 
but also in the part of our leaders and why I was so disgusted at the way we were misled and poorly led in so many of the countries around the world, which could have and should have known better. There's some evidence that these zoonotic diseases, these, these diseases that originate in animals and leap to humans are rising with time and that the inter-pandemic interval is shortening. So earlier at the beginning of my remarks, I said these, these serious things come every 50 or 100 years, but some people fear, and I am among them, that they now may be coming every 30 to 50 years, for example. Plus they're stochastic, meaning that they could come at any time. Just because it took 50 years for this to happen, the next one could come in five years, literally. There's absolutely no reason that it couldn't happen. So plagues offer new challenges and new opportunities. And I've highlighted some of the ways in which, in my remarks today, this evening, I've highlighted some of the ways in which they elicit some bad qualities in us. They also elicit good qualities like collaboration and cooperation and the deployment of our wisdom and science to confront the threats, the, the fact that thousands of scientists had labored for for you know, decades to produce the knowledge that was useful to us and that the world mobilized, international organizations cooperated, scientists around the world cooperated, tens of thousands of citizens volunteered for these, uh, these uh, epidemics and countless other uh, sacrifices were made. People sacrificed their money. Some healthcare workers sacrificed their lives to care for us, which is another topic we haven't discussed and we could talk about. Uh, there were many amazing, you know, uh, so-called essential workers, truckers, and people delivering food and so on, took tremendous risks to keep our economy somewhat functional. So there were many wonderful qualities that we manifested as well, not just bad qualities. And so I'd like to close with a quote from um, Albert Camus' a famous uh, novel, the, the, uh, uh, La Peste, The Plague, uh, which is a fictionalized account of a plague sweeping the village of Oran in Algeria in the 1940s, but is based on an 1849 uh, cholera outbreak and also surely on bubonic plague outbreaks that swept North Africa and Europe in prior centuries. The protagonist of this book is a physician by the name of Dr. Rieu. And here's what Camus writes. He says, Dr. Rieu resolved to compile this chronicle so that some memorial of the injustice and outrage done them might endure, and to state quite simply what we learn in time of pestilence, that there are more things to admire in men and women than to despise. And that's very much how I feel about life in general. I'm an optimist. I think we're a miraculous species. As uh, Ian mentioned, I wrote this other book called Blueprint, The Evolutionary Origins of a Good Society. Uh, and this is how I like to see how we will see the other side of this 21st century plague that we are facing. Thank you. Okay, I think we can uh, open it up for questions. And uh, I see, uh, you know where the command is for the little uh, yellow head? Maybe uh, while we're starting, I can ask uh, an icebreaker question. Um, the causal drivers of the pandemic are still debated with much attention of late, perhaps stimulated by geopolitics as much as by science, focused on the possibility of a lab leak from facilities in China. And you cast scientific doubt on that speculation in Apollo Zero. I mean, it's uh, hard to be, it could be either way. I mean, I think still most likely was a zoonotic leap but it's hard to exclude that it could have been a, a lab leak as well. We, we don't have enough evidence one way or the other. I'm sorry, go on, I interrupted you. I didn't mean to. I'm, actually, I did mean to, but I, I didn't mean oh, to go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> no problem. <laughs> uh, so I, I've been reading a lot of the social scientists and epidemiologists working in the Marxist tradition. They argue that a lot of those causal drivers behind these pandemics are related to what they call a metabolic rift between nature and humanity that was opened up really with the industrial revolution and the rise of what they call fossil capitalism. So this is a driver of global climate change, but they would also say it's also connected to the, the pandemics. And you know, and I noticed that you were saying inter-pandemic interval may be shortening. And I think that is a, in some ways parallel to what they're saying, which is if you look at the number of these zoonotic diseases that are arising, it's really quite striking how many of them are, are coming from areas in which there are a lot of industrial farms, there's a lot of deforestation, there's a rapid and stark uh, conquest of 
new territories. And they say, yes, and that's going to throw up, in addition to climate change, that's going to basically create, you know, call upon species like bats, the horseshoe bats that are sort of the prime suspects in this one. They're going to start ranging abroad. They're sort of going to be, basically these species will be swept up into the huge trade winds that globalization has set in motion. So if you really want to address this pandemic, you also have to address in a way, neoliberal globalization. I sense that you're more in tune to kind of what I would call perennialist interpretations. So this is just part of the human condition and you know, we'll be going through these. What would you say to Marxists who are more struck by the unusual dangers set in motion by global climate change? Okay, there's so much in that question. First of all, there is a connection between climate change and pandemics. Uh, as we um, modify the climate, we lead to mass migrations of humans, we deforest the land, we change the terrain of animals. So we come into more contact with animals and that leads to more opportunities for zoonotic leaps. And there's no doubt that there is a connection in my judgment between climate change and uh, pandemic disease. Now, the, the broader argument there, I would reject in some sense, and there's many pathways we could go down. First, I'll just say that, um, that pathogens have always been a feature of our environment, right? We've been, you know, these bacteria and viruses uh, preceded us by hundreds of millions of years, and they were on the planet long before we were, and they infected us with delight, uh, you know, long before we had capitalism or any other kind of thing that Marxists would be concerned with, first point. However, there is a narrow truth that the way of living of human beings is connected to these types of pandemics, but it's not with the onset of, of uh, of the industrial revolution. It actually goes back to the agricultural revolution. So about 8,000, 10,000 years ago, we begin to domesticate plants and animals. The agricultural revolution begins. Shortly thereafter, we have, we invent cities. About 8,000 years ago, we invent cities. And it's the special combination of large agglomerations of humans living chock-a-block with their domesticated animals that gave rise to many of the first pandemics. So you don't really have pandemic disease when you have, a, you know, 5 million human beings occupying the entire planet living in groups of 30 in hunter-gatherer bands because they're not interacting in a way that can give rise to this. You need large agglomerations. And, and many people trace back, for example, the origin of measles to Rome when you had a million people. Rome was an enormous city and you actually had not quite as big agglomerations in, uh, in the old world, you know, in Mayan civilizations, for example. So you would have um, a million people living right next to domesticated cattle and we now have been able with genetic analyses to trace that measles probably arose from a mutation of a, of a, of a disease that afflicts cattle called rinderpest. So, so the argument that our way of life has contributed to pandemics is in that sense true, but it's not a recent thing. It goes back a few thousand years uh, to really uh, nail it down. I would take issue, and there are a couple other things. On the, you mentioned the perennialist thing. Uh, yes, I am a perennialist in the sense that I think that there are fundamental qualities of human beings that have been shaped by natural selection. And for example, this includes our, our uh, capacity to love each other. You know, we form a sent sentimental attachment to our mates, uh, which is, um, which is, is um, seen universally. Uh, we befriend each other, which is a very unusual feature of species. Other animals don't form, other animals have sex with each other like we do. But we also form long-term non-reproductive unions to other members of our species. Namely, we have friends. This is very rare. We do it, certain primates do it, elephants do it, certain cetaceans do it. So natural selection has shaped our certain features of our social life, our, our, our capacity for love, our capacity for friendship, and so on. All of that's discussed in Blueprint. And that's intrinsic to human beings. That's seen universally. So there's a debate, of course, in anthropology between cultural universals and, and you know, uh, cultural universalism and cultural relativism. It's an old debate. I'm kind of on the universalist side. I'm not saying that, um, all I'm saying is that there are universals. I'm not saying that they're, they're the only interesting thing because of course, history and culture matter. And there is a tremendous variety in human social forms. Um, but I would sort of reject the Marxian idea that we are endlessly malleable, you know, that we can by, the, by creation of any society, you know, Stalin thought this. In fact, Stalin was quite angry, uh, as you might know, at, uh, at genetics, he saw it as a threat to, uh, uh, I mean, I know Stalin 
it was his own set of ideologies and problems, but I don't mean to go to Stalin immediately. But, but anyway, so there's a, a sense in which uh, the Marxism and, and, um, and genetics have been in tension for quite a while. Anyway, those are some responses to your question. Go ahead. I'm seeing a question from Ken. Thank you very much. Uh, a wonderful talk. Um, I have two kinds of questions, but maybe I'll just ask one, which is um, simply to ask you, you did your work and uh, wrote your book early on, really, now as we see it. I wonder what, 19, what uh, 2021 changes at all? Does it change anything in the kind of conclusions you re reached uh, about what's going on? Honestly, I would say no, um, you know, um, because these pandemic has followed the, the pandemic playbook. I mean, you know, it's, right. it's uh, it was one of the reasons I wrote the book. I mean, the vaccines came faster than I thought, but not much faster. I thought they might come in the first quarter of 2021 and that that would be miraculous if it did happen. But even if it came as early as the first quarter of 2021, it wouldn't really modify it would save lives, but it wouldn't modify the trajectory, the basic trajectory of the epidemic, of the pandemic. And, uh, you know, the vaccines came even earlier than that. They were, the announcement was in November of 2020. By December of 2020, the RCTs were published and we had vaccination began. So, um, so that was a little bit faster, but not much faster. Um, the, one of the things that's unusual for pandemics is usually with the passage of time, the, the, the lethality of the germ tends to decline, but there had been exceptions. And I discussed those in Apollo Zero. For example, in the 1918 pandemic, the second wave was four times as deadly as the first wave. And I'm a little worried that we're seeing that with COVID, which is not something I'd, I mean, I said was possible, but I, I kind of secretly didn't think that was likely. Uh, but it, it, it looks like it is happening, you know, that, uh, that COVID, unfortunately, with the variants especially, uh, we are not seeing a rapid decline in, in uh, mortality impact. So, you know, there are things like that. Like I, I, I sort of laid out a range of possibilities. Uh, Ian mentioned the lab leak thing. I discussed the lab leak hypothesis in the book. I say that the zoonotic leak was more likely. I still believe it's more likely. You know, do I now, based on the evidence that's come out in the last year, you know, if like when I wrote the book, I might've thought the lab leak was a 10% probability. Now maybe I think it's a 20 or percent probability, let's say. So more, you know, given what we've learned so far, mostly because I think the Chinese would have been less secretive if they, you know, they're, 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 the way they're acting in a secretive way is, you know, raises suspicions. You know, why don't, if it's not a lab leak, why don't you release the data so we can know that it wasn't, you know, that's a factor. And certain other little piece of information have come out about certain timing stuff. My lab has done some work on the timing um, that, you know, maybe up the probability, but I still think a zoonotic leap is more likely. Anyway, those are some things that are, you know, the passage of time has kind of modified my thinking a little. Did I answer your question? Absolutely, thank you. Um, I was just gonna ask you also about, uh, we share a continent uh, and, a, and a long border. Uh, should we be concerned by the vaccination rate in the US? When you can, I mean, you, you, you're higher, obviously, in the second dose, but we are. Yeah, I was going to say, my understanding is it's worse in Canada for a change. So I, at the beginning of the. <laughs> for the second dose, but I mean, I think that when we, when we have a now almost 75% rate for the first dose, and one assumes that as the supply is available, there'll be, people will take the second dose, whereas the U.S., we're looking at, you know, closer yes. to hovering in the 50% range. Well, it's 70. My understanding is that we have, we're, we're going to just fall short of Biden's target of 70%. By oh, okay. uh, but, uh, but yes, the higher the percentage of people vaccinated, for sure, the better. Use of superior vaccines is also helpful because it's not, you want to use, you want as many people vaccinated as possible and you want them to have the highest level of immunity possible. So for example, 70% vaccinated with a Sinopharm Chinese vaccine is not the same as 70% vaccinated with the Moderna or the Novavax vaccine, which was just released, approved, or the, um, or the uh, Pfizer vaccine and so on, uh, or even the Johnson & Johnson vaccine or the AstraZeneca vaccine. Th those, the, the adenovirus vaccines, the Johnson & Johnson adenovirus, are a little less effective in terms of preventing illness, but we think may not be less effective in terms of preventing death, which is another whole topic. Anyway, yes, the higher percentage, the better. 
I, I, uh, I suspect the Canadians in the end will, will have a higher percentage vaccinated because you're more community, community minded than, than, uh, than, than, uh, than the USA, than the, than the Americans. And, um, so yes, that's better, but the new variants were going to have very, require us to have very high levels of vaccination. I want you guys to, I want us to be able to cross the border again, Candidate. <laughs> yeah. uh, you know, like, uh, uh, really, I mean, I, I can't even believe this. It's the first time in my life I can't drive into Canada. I got upset when I started having to have my passport to go into Canada. I used to be able to go with my driver's license. But now I can't even go at all. So it's really upsetting me. Uh, I, those of you, I don't know if any, some of you mentioned in the chat that you're from Nova Scotia. I mean, I don't know if you've been to Warren Lake or you've been to some of the other places in the Cape Breton Highland National Park. It's transcendently beautiful. And I really miss it. Thank you. Karen. I'll do all my technical things. Um, this is a question that floats some around the idea of the layering of grief in the last year and a half and the specificity of, how, of the confluence of the last year and a half. As we started out today, I was telling you a little bit about this history of 2020 course that I was, was teaching with a bunch of really amazing students this spring and was divided into perhaps obviously politics, pandemics, and protests. And I remember one very earnest Good. student saying to me that it was just exhausting to live through so many varieties of major historical change at the same time. So one of the things I've been thinking about as I've been listening to you, is it one kind of historical change and something that as you've argued is, is, a, is you know, a new instantiation of a repeated historical system instead? Um, or is, is there something particular about the, the confluence here? You talked about politics. So I, let me- What know, about the, the way that protest and a particular kinds of injustice protests layered onto the last year? Uh, I, so I have a bunch of things to say to that. First of all, I, I need to, as a preamble, I need to say that I'm not one of those people who goes kids these days, you know, like I, like I, I've devoted like many of you, my life to the education of the next generation. I like and admire young people. I enjoy their company and so on. But at the same time, we have to recognize that they're young and, uh, and we are the faculty. And this idea that there's something really awful about their predicament is, is false. I mean, they would better off being a young person today than in the Second World War, right? I mean, their, their, their age cohort 60 years ago was at the age of 20 exiting uh, onto Normandy Beach and being shot down by machine guns. So there's absolutely no sense in which they are actually worse off than prior generations. Uniformly, on average, everyone alive today is vastly better off than everyone alive, every student alive 30 or 50 years ago. Same thing goes, with, by the way, with racial issues. Yes, we are still a society in progress. Yes, we have more to do when it comes to racial equality, but the belief that we are now living at some period of racism that surpasses what was seen, for example, during the civil rights movement when we still had lynchings, you know, or a period when we still had lynchings, that's just false, right? I mean, if you just look at interracial marriage, uh, the, uh, for example, rates which are skyrocketing, we live in a different and better world than we did 50 years ago. So on the one hand, I, I would say to the young people, I would say, yes, I hear where you're coming from, and it is stressful to have these experiences of, uh, of protest and plague. And uh, I forgot the third P that you mentioned. Um, but it is in fact not, you are not worse off than kids 30 or 50 or 100 years ago, first point. Second point, there's a, 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 an empirical observation in, in the history of epidemics, which is that these epidemics often seem to come um, there's like a perfect storm of things that afflict society. So for example, there's a wonderful book by a historian, I think it's Princeton University Press on climate change during Rome and plagues. Some historian has made a connection between climate change and pandemics in Rome 2000 years ago. And, uh, and we also see this, the, the role of climate change during the bubonic outbreaks, which lasted about 500 years in Europe and actually ultimately ebbed because of people theorized because of a cold snap in 1655, I think. So you often see plagues during times of war, during times of famine, during times of heightened inequality, uh, 
so all of these things, there's some people who theorize there's something like that they, that, that they literally all go together. So your point about how the students are observing that there's a lot going on, in a way they're right. And this also has been seen in the past. The last thing I'll say is, is, is actually a point I, I, I mentioned during my remarks and I said we might come back to is, is that plagues are often a time of meaning. Yeah. Now, in, in historical time, this was manifested through religion. So during times of plague, people's religiosity typically goes up. And actually, Gallup surveys in the United States show the same thing during COVID-19. Even though churches were closed, people's prayer went up, uh, appeals to a deity went up. Uh, and it's a pretty, pretty common human response, right? When death is in the streets, people start turning to religion. And, and by the way, when, when the plague ends, then you return to the previous secularism. So you know, that's one of the reasons religion will plummet. Uh, we, so, so plagues are a time of meaning. And we also see that, for instance, in, in occupational choices. For example, applications to medical school and nursing school are booming, right? Young people find meaning in engaging in helping professions. Uh, everyday workers, people in uh, blue collar workers found new meaning and purpose in their lives. You know, the truckers, you know, I don't know, you guys probably know this, but, you know, we rely enormously on truckers who transport our goods. Uh, you know, I think in the United States, there are a million or two million people are employed as truckers. And, it, and, uh, and these individuals now saw new meaning in their work, right? They were essential workers to transporting the goods and services. So they found new meaning. And I think the Black Lives Matter protests of last summer that you mentioned also partly reflected this phenomenon. So on the one hand, we absolutely have had a kind of decades long problem with racialized police violence in our society. And people are getting increasingly pissed about this. So that's of course in the background. It's true that the econ economy had collapsed and people were protesting because they were also jobless and that I'm sure contributed to the protest. It's also true that people were unemployed and stuck at home and were bored and that people argued played a role in the BLM protest and I'm, that's also true. But also it's true I think that they were searching for meaning. So when people, when death is in the streets in the form of plague and people are stuck at home, they think about what's important to me in my life? What's important to me in my society? What kind of society do I wanna live in? And I think this contributed as well profoundly to the protests that we saw where people were advocating for a more just society. And, uh, and they were thinking about for themselves what's important to them, what could they, difference could they make? But it's not just the left-wing phenomenon because I actually think the January 6th insurrection at the nation's capital, which was the, was the right wing analog of that. One of the things that struck me about that, uh, that riot was that none of them were masked. Those people that stormed the Capitol made no effort to conceal their identity. They were proud of what they were doing. And for them, it was not about stopping an election you know, and acting in this anti-democratic way. For them, it was about patriotism, right? They thought they were being patriots, that this was the meaning, this was meaningful and important to them. So I agree with you, Karen. I think that, that plagues do intersect with these kinds of, um, uh, these broader meanings and these broader themes in our society. Did I answer your question? So, yeah, I mean, I think we disagree on some of the specifics there. And I didn't want, I didn't mean at all to imply that I felt my students were whining quite. Um, you didn't imply quite the re, that. Quite the, re, you know, the reverse. I think that what I saw was earnest young people in a crisis around meaning making. How were they going to make sense of and take action in a world that just seemed to be, you know, spinning around them in, in so many ways? And, uh, you know, and sometimes it was really hard for me to, I felt like I couldn't be that sage on the stage saying like, no, 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 it's going to be okay. I felt like the way that I had to respond to that was to actually be in the middle of it with them and say, yeah, this does, you know, this is yes. complicated. This is happening in all, in all kinds of ways at the same time, where we might disagree might be on a, you know, an understanding of racial, of racial, of racial progress. Because I see a lot of, I saw you, I see a lot of regress, right? right now I, I would ask yeah we would have to look at the indicators of that yeah. uh because i think most of the indicators that i track are positive uh so i i you know i'm not saying we live in a perfect society of course not and there was much progress still to be made but i think there's no sense in which it's worse to be a minority in one of our societies today than it was you know 20 30 50 certainly 100 years ago 
on the on the the pedagogy you use with the students, I think that's really good pedagogy because uh, not that you asked my opinion, but I, I agree with you is what I'm saying is that uh, is that allying yourself with the students and saying this is what it means to be a human in the world, yeah. this is what it means to be an adult. It it's tough, <laughs> you know, it's confusing, it's dangerous, it's risky, it's hard to know what to do. Yes, I hear you. I think that's exactly right. And I was actually thinking about the specificities of layering of grief, particularly today. I don't know if you heard, but today is a particularly painful day for Canadians. Um, when we had yet another... Yeah, the 751, the 751 yeah, yeah. bodies. Yes. And I have to say, there was a way in which it absolutely broke me to see this yes. young, steadfast chief of the Coasis First Nation putting his mask on and off in yeah, the middle I mean, of this press conference explaining what had happened. I mean, that the was same a, thing, in some ways a sideline, but to me, that I moment mean, broke I mean, the, me. Yes, and the brutality of, I mean, it's, 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 it's intersects, of course, with the uh, indigenous issues. The same thing happened in Australia, as I'm sure you know, but it's not always a phenomenon. For example, if you look at the Irish orphanages where they found like all of these bodies of people that were buried you know, in Ireland a hundred years ago, uh, young women that were sent there because they got pregnant, you know, and then they were brutalized and of course, I'm sure assaulted and then died in different deaths and their bodies were buried out back. And there was no intersection of indig ind indigeneity there. The, the, the mistreatment of children in our society is a more general theme, which actually interests my wife and me quite a lot, but it's another whole topic. So what I'm saying is, is that, yes, I saw that and it broke me to see that, you know, those 751. And I'm sure there are many, I mean, that's probably the tip of the iceberg, candidly. Uh, so, yes. Okay. Um, are there anyone else have a, a question? I, I might ask Nicholas uh, a question that occurred to me about the lessons one might draw about your book about the United States. And that, I mean, I think you could fairly say yours is a profoundly American book. That that's sort of what its what its focus is. Sometimes you're laceratingly self-critical about your own country. How would you explain the extent to which the U.S. case now serves many people as a cautionary tale rather than as an uplifting example of how a nation can engage with something like COVID-19? Well, I mean, I try to be measured in, the, in Apollo Zero, but, you know, in this group here, even though I'm being videotaped, I'll just say that, you know, I'm, I'm ashamed at how we did as a nation. I mean, it, it, it's appalling. Uh, and, and, um, I can't, I, I can't honestly can't believe it, uh, given our wealth and our sophistication, um, and our democratic, um, rule, you know, I'm astonished at, um, at how poorly we fared. And, and in part, you know, I do, certainly call the previous administration to task in Apollo Zero. And, you know, I'm also a little bit stunned at my fellow citizens in our, in our nation that they, you know, they were poorly led, but also didn't, not enough of them have risen, I think, to the challenge that is, is before us. But uh, in terms of my um, feeling about the United States, I, I think it's always a bad idea to bet against the United States. And here I'm going to quote James Baldwin. I don't know if you guys know James Baldwin. He was a African-American, um, uh, I don't know what you would call him. He was just a genius, uh, literary critic and uh, philosopher. Anyway, he has this very famous uh, interview he did, uh, which uh, he says is precisely because he loved America so much that he reserved the right to criti criticize her endlessly. <laughs> and, and, that's, and that's sort of how I feel. In other words, you know, we are a free society. I am free to criticize our country and our government, thank goodness. And I, uh, and I intend to do so. <laughs> No, I, I, I agree with you that, uh, you know, that it is that we did, uh, we, we really did poorly. And here, I also think we have an opportunity. I mean, we haven't talked about geopolitics much today, although there's a lot of interesting things with respect to this pandemic, also with respect to China. Yes. I think in the end, China may, 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 may be the loser for this, actually, in the end. Mm -hmm. But I think there's an opportunity here for the United States and other rich democracies to vaccinate the world and to show leadership. And I, I worry that we're not doing that. And I didn't mention this earlier when I said we had a moral reason to do so, economic and epidemiological. We also have a kind of geopolitical reason to do this and why we are not you know, racing to vaccinate the world, I, I don't understand, honestly. Uh, you know, I, don't, 
I don't, I know, uh, anyway, so I don't know whether what Canada is doing in this regard. Right now you're, I'm, I'm, I mean, the, anyway, so that's, you know, I have complicated feelings about the United States and how they've handled the pandemic. Let's just say that. I mean, on that question of vaccines, you'd have to also factor in property rights, intellectual property rights that you know, really some, some countries wanted to suspend in the course of the pandemic. And a lot of the rich countries, Canada included, and the United States said, you know, hands off our property rights. We really want this to be a profitable enterprise. No, I, I, I think that's a misdirection, actually. I think that it just, you know, we can use plain old capitalism to solve this problem. When, when the Americans during the Second World War needed more tanks and Jeeps than anyone else, the government just bought them and American industry produced them and they just cost money. And I honestly think that the, the property rights issue is an almost a bit of a posturing by various countries around the world on both sides of that. Really, what we just need to do is find $50 billion, which is peanuts for Japan and, the, and England and, and the United States and Canada and China, where everyone chipped in and just buy it from the pharmaceutical companies. Okay, they'll get the 50 billion, that's fine. That's the solution in my judgment. And actually, candidly, even if we liberalize the IP, there's not the manufacturing capability around the world to do this. So, and the distribution capability. So we, we have so many other issues that I think could be more effectively solved, candidly. In this case, I think just let the market do its job, but buy it have the governments buy the vaccines and distribute them. And then I think that'll be faster in the end than saying, in a way I think saying we'll give away the IP is the cheap way out and won't lead to what the outcome that we want. My opinion, that's just my opinion. It goes back to the point you start off with with a you know, need for a strong government. Yes, and good leadership and a willing citizenry, right? You have to come to the Canadians and you say, we're all gonna have to pay more taxes uh, and we're gonna pay more taxes for this reason. We're going to vaccinate the world because it's the right thing to do and we're Canadians and we're going to do it because um, we need to you know, prevent deaths on a, on a planetary scale. And we're going to work with our allies, et cetera, et cetera. That requires leadership, honestly, and a good citizenry. I think there's plenty of responsibility to go around. I'll ask one last question unless somebody else wants to, but the one last question. <laughs> you, you wrote this book in summer 2020 and I guess a new edition is coming out, a paperback edition. Uh, yes. So that was before the Great Barrington Declaration debate really got going. And you know, the mask debate was still sort of coalescing. You've wandered into, uh, very knowledgeably into all these debates up against very loud voices in the public sphere, including sometimes fellow medical specialists on these questions. Would you agree that these debates suggest how difficult it has become for intellectuals to wade into controversies, particularly in the age of social media. And have you yourself personally paid a price for taking positions in these debates? Well, I've certainly over the last 20 years paid some price, I suppose, for different sorts of positions I've taken, but not, I don't think, with respect to the pandemic. Yes. Uh, uh, the, um, I think that, um, that the, the, the opinions advanced by the people in the Great Barrington Declaration are wrong. Uh, I, I think that uh, it's not crazy for them to articulate those views. They're right insofar as they're saying, look, we need to also consider the costs of these non-pharmaceutical interventions. I mean, that's, that's correct. We do need to consider the costs. But I take issue with uh, the way they minimize some of the risks uh, of, the, of the pathogen. And I also don't agree with their conclusion that you know, we'd be better off having done less, let's say. Uh, I think in an ideal world, we would try to keep politics out of science. This is also an old philosophical topic, by the way. I mean, people have been talking about whether science can even be apolitical at all for, for thousands of years, uh, for hundreds of years. I won't say thousands on that one. And, uh, and, I, and, I, and I think that, um, but I, it, my fantasy is that we can, to the extent possible, depoliticize it and try to just form a scientific opinion about what is the truth of the world. And then, then we can have our ideological debate at that point, having formed this opinion about what is actually true about the world, then we can disagree about what to do about that. And we can, we can fight about what's true, but we can use this sort of scientific method, I think, to, to come to some consensus on that. And I think that the, the, the fantasy that this virus was, been, was just a flu, or this fantasy that this virus would just go away, you know, was a lie. 
And, I, and, and we now know many of the people that were saying that knew they were lying. For example, our former president, uh, you know, which is they should be held to account for this. We've reached the hour point, which in my experience of Zoom is a, probably a good point to call the evening to a close. But I think we would all like to thank you, Nicholas, for a excellent talk and a wonderful question and answer session afterwards. So thank you so much. <laughs> thank you so much for having me. I wish I could be there in person, perhaps next time. Yes, come thank to the blasters sometime. <laughs> yes. Thank you so much. Bye. So